Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to spend the first talk talking about intelligence and motor abilities. And I've actually called this talk in the end New Insights into the Interrelation between Cognitive and Motor Performance. Um, the data that I'm going to show you um, is data that's been collected in different studies. Um, some of this data has been collected along with two of my PhD students, Duncan Brown and Michelle Pratt at the University of London, and that's through funding from oh, the um, Economic Research Council in the UK and also the University of London. But I'm also going to talk about some data that Bowen, Smits Engelman and various other people <coughs> in the Netherlands have collected and that Bowen and I have analysed, or Bowen's analysed and we've interpreted um, a bit more recently. So as you'll all be very aware, DC diagnosis is linked in both DSM and ICD to cognitive abilities. And in it, by that, what, what they're referring to is IQ. But how do we operationalise those, that aspect of the criteria for either clinic work, clinical diagnosis, intervention and so on, but also for research purposes? Apparently, DCD children, adults, should have motor development out of keeping with other aspects of their development. So generally, we preclude children with an IQ below 70 or 80 as having a diagnosis of DCD. But actually, when you look into the literature, there isn't any data that exists to show us whether that's the right cutoff, whether we should be making that exclusion, and so on. So we <coughs> were interested um, in looking into various data sets to answer for research questions. Um, and we're going to go through these questions one by one during the talk. So I'm not going to read them all out now. But essentially, looking at this issue of the link between IQ measurement and motor ability and how we might understand those together and the implications. So for the first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on these three questions. And these are the data that I've been working on with Bowen. Can motor coordination impairment be explained in terms of general intellectual retardation? So if you have a low IQ, you have poor motor impairment, and that's kind of that. What level of motor performance is to be expected given a person's measured intelligence? So actually, if your IQ is 100, what do we expect of your motor abilities? If your IQ is 50, what should we expect? And we can then start to understand better the, the discrepancy, if you like, between those, if there is one. At what point are motor difficulties considered to be in excess of those usually associated with mental retardation or learning disability? So that's going to be the focus of the first section of the talk. And then the last, the second section of the talk will focus on that last question we'll come to. So in this first study, um, we reviewed IQ and movement ABC data that had been collected by Bowen and various other people in the Netherlands and in Flanders. Um, these children were educated in either mainstream schools, special education settings. Data was collected also from clinics. Um, in the Netherlands and Flanders, all children had an IQ, a measured IQ greater than 50. And children who had epilepsy, epilepsy or who had been born premature were excluded from the study. So the data set consisted of 509 children, 337 males, which had a mean age of nine years and an age range between four and 16. Um, there were four key groups of children included, children from mainstream education, um, children from special education, children who'd been diagnosed in a clinic um, with probable DCD, and then we also included data from a group of children who had motor difficulties that were linked to an acquired brain injury. This was a sort of go back to the files and extract data from a, a sort of different range of studies. And so there are a number of IQ tests that had been completed within these studies. Um, the Vexler test, WISC and Whoopsie, so the Vexler scale for children and also for preschool children. The Kaufman assessment battery for children and a Dutch one that I'm not going to try and pronounce, as well as the Raven's nonverbal matrices. Um, these are all standardised tests, so you can compare <coughs> IQ scores across these. 
So the first question, can motor coordination impairment be explained in terms of general intellectual retardation? The first thing that we did here was we took the whole sample of children, 509 children, and we correlated the data, their IQ scores, and their movement ABC centile. And we used the centile scores um, because we've got the movement ABC, the movement ABC2 here, and then this way we can kind of compare the data in a straightforward way. And what you can see is, as you would expect, full-scale IQ as well as verbal and performance IQ correlate very significantly with your motor skills as measured by the movement ABC. Also looking at this question, what you have here is IQ along, use the mouse, IQ along the x-axis here, that works, you can see, and then up here we have the movement ABC centile, and here you have all the data, the data for each individual child plotted, <coughs> and what you see, if you analyse these data, that <coughs> around 22% of the variance in motor outcome is explained by full-scale IQ. So there's around 22% of that being explained. So that's a reasonable amount, but it's not the whole amount. Um, there's a linear trend, which you see with this uh, trend line, <coughs> but there are exceptions in each group. So there are children in each of these different schooling groups who, whose IQ isn't clearly explained, um, it, whose motor skill isn't clearly explained by IQ. So only 22% of the variance in motor outcome in this sample relates to intellectual functioning or IQ. What about the remaining 78%, the vast majority of the variance? There are a number of things that perhaps could explain or be added into the model to explain motor, motor outcome as well as full-scale IQ. And these sorts of things may include attention, executive function, so higher order cognitive skills that are involved in things like planning, um, switching from one task or thought to another, organising a whole sequence of actions, inhibition, stopping yourself doing something that you now need to not do anymore. <coughs> Perhaps automatisation may be involved, and I'm sure there's a whole other range of, of variables that ought to be considered um, that you would <coughs> kind of pose yourselves. So question two, what level of motor performance is to be expected given the person's measured intelligence? So if I see a child who has an IQ of 60, actually what, what level of motor skill should I expect of that child? And then I can start to think about how, how much more, how much worse or how much better than that their motor skill is. So what you see here is IQ again along the x-axis running along the bottom and centile movement ABC on the y-axis <laughs> and the vertical axis. And you see here in the bold black line with the squares, the um, level of motor performance per IQ point for, for that sample. And then what we've got at the top and the bottom are the 95% confidence interview intervals. Now we included and excluded the acquired brain injury group in this analysis and it makes no difference, so they're included here. And what we find here is that with each one third of a percentile point lost on the movement ABC, we see, we see that for each one IQ percentile point. And that equates to a mean loss of 10 percentile points on the movement ABC for each one standard deviation or 15 standardised points on, on an IQ scale. So we can now start to consider that maybe we could say, OK, if you've got an IQ of 60, then we'd expect this percentile level on the movement ABC. Um, the clinical implications of this are that a larger motor deficit than, than this 10 percentile point drop indicates motor difficulty over and above the impact of your IQ. And perhaps we might think that you could, or you should, you could mediate intervene therapeutically 
with that motor difficulty, perhaps in a different way, depending on whether a child is within the range you would expect for their IQ or outside of it. And then our final question here, at what point are motor difficulties in excess of those usually associated with mental retardation or learning disability? So here we exclude the acquired brain injury group because they have a known lesion or a known um, organic effect that will um, affect their movement skill. And what we did here was using the DSM <coughs> categories for IQ, we split the remaining children into three groups. Those who were described as having a normal IQ, that is a standardised score on an IQ of full-scale IQ of 85 or above. Children who have what would be considered borderline IQ under DSM, so borderline learning disability, uh, an IQ score of between 71 and 84. And children who would be defined under DSM as having a mild mental retardation or learning disability, those children <coughs> whose IQ scores fall between 50 and 70. So first of all, if we, we look at the division of IQ against movement ABC classification, where we have normal range above the 16th centile or equal to or above the 16th centile. <coughs> at risk children, those whose movement ABC centile scores fall between the 6th and the 15th centile, and children who would be classified as impaired on the movement ABC <coughs> scoring at or below the fifth centile. And what you see in this table is the percentage of each IQ group, normal, borderline, mild, mental retardation, in showing these different categories on the movement ABC. And here, clearly, what you see is that half of, <coughs> half of the um, children who are in the normal IQ range <coughs> fall in the normal movement ABC range. <coughs> And 80, almost 85% of the children in the mild learning disability, so the, the lowest IQ group, fall into the lowest movement ABC group. So there's, there's this tendency for these divisions, but you can see from the percentages that it's by no means a consistent finding that all children with a good IQ, are all, well, almost all children are in the normal movement group, and all children who have that much, much lower IQ have the worst movement ABC scores. So we've unpacked that a bit further here, where you have, again, IQ groups on, on the horizontal x-axis. Um, you've got <coughs> retardation, mental retardation on your <coughs> left, borderline in the middle, and normal range on your right. And what you see here is the range of the scores and then the little numbers which you can't read are all individual children who are sort of outliers, they're out <coughs> of the sort of broad range of their group. And again, what you can see is that there's a sort of condensing in an area for each group in terms of their motor outcome, but there's a lot of children relatively who fall kind of outside that range. And they're perhaps the most, they're the interesting children, really. W what is it that makes them different? If you compare these three IQ groups using a standard ANOVA, so you're simply looking to see whether there's a difference between the three IQ groups in terms of their movement ABC centile score, then we find a highly significant difference between the three <coughs> groups. And if we pursue that with post hoc tests, we see that all three groups differ from one another. So there's a significant difference between the retardation group and the borderline group, the retardation group and the normal group, and between the borderline group <coughs> and the normal group. So there are very clear differences between them when you consider the group data. But you can see very clearly from this slide, from this figure, and you could see it in the table I presented in a previous slide, that there are children with normal motor skill on the movement ABC in all three IQ groups.
And you can turn that around and you can say there are children in all three IQ groups who, who have atypical um, motor skill or motor skill out of keeping with their IQ. So there's a clear group difference with lower IQ scorers generally having lower motor skill. There are children in each IQ category who have normal motor outcome. The majority of children who have an IQ below 85 do fall in the movement ABC impaired range, but 9% of those fall within the typical range or the normal range on the movement ABC. So to summarise this first study, overall lower IQ equates to lower motor skill, just as a, as a broad um, principle, but we see motor skill at all levels of proficiency across all um, of the IQ range, and not all children who have a learning disability or who have mental retardation have motor impairments. And this suggests a reasonable degree of separation between the cognitive and motor system. Now, as clinicians, we might want to be cautious when interpreting the scores of children with learning disabilities on motor test batteries. Um, partly, or at least partly, because these tests are not necessarily really specific for that IQ group. And so they may not be terribly appropriate measures necessarily, or perhaps instructions, for that group of children. And so I think we certainly need to develop instruments with greater validity in this group, given that we see that perhaps there is a wider range of motor skill in lower IQ groups than perhaps one might or the diagnostic manuals might suggest. That's probably no surprise to you. Okay. <coughs> so in the next part of the talk, what I want to do is move to looking at quite a fine-grained consideration of performance of children and adults with DCD whose IQ falls within the normal range um, on Vexler um, intelligence scales, either adult or child, and start looking at this question in a slightly different way. So this, this final question um, it relates to whether there are particular IQ profiles of peaks and troughs in children without and adults with DCD. And this, this arises partly, or the motivator for this was partly a UK-based um, concern, I suppose, that I, I don't think is really a, a, such an issue in the Netherlands. But this is that there is quite a a vocal and powerful group of um, educators who argue very strongly for using the term dyspraxia rather than DCD, but they use it in a very unusual sense. They argue that really what they're talking about is something very similar to DCD, but they completely disregard any motor component of the disorder and argue that really all you need to do is a cognitive and IQ assessment. And as DCD researchers, we feel very strongly that that is an inappropriate argument. And so one of the things we could do from data that uh, my lab had collected was start to look at whether you really do see one single cognitive profile in a DCD population, um, with our hypothesis being uh, that you wouldn't. So that was sort of the UK context <coughs> or motivator for, for looking at these data in this way. But there are also interesting questions about, sort of more broadly, about links between IQ scores and motor outcome, um, just more generally. So we know that DCD is diagnosed on the basis, or partly on the basis of motor impairment, affecting activities of daily living or educational achievement. <coughs> And I, I imagine that for most of the, the people that you see, it's probably both. The motor skill is, as you know, out of keeping with a child's age and intelligence. And so this kind of leads on to the general necessity of profiling, profiling IQ. So in this kind of set of 
uh, data presentation, we were using detailed IQ testing using full versions of the Vexler Intelligence Scale for children and for adults. Um, and then we were able to use those data to compare the IQ profile between groups. So we have DCD and typically <coughs> developing individuals. But we were also interested in comparing individual differences in IQ profiles, whether all of our participants would show the same peaks and troughs, if any exist, across the IQ kind of subtests, or whether we'd see maybe two or three different combinations or just a whole mixture. So this is work that I've been collecting with my PhD students, Duncan Brown and Michelle Pratt. Um, we used, so we used the Vexler Intelligence Scale for Children, which has 10 subtests and five composite scores. And it's the composite scores, including full-scale IQ, that I'm going to be presenting today. This is how the tests break down. It's not hugely important for the talk. Are you all familiar with this test, or do you want me to describe it a little bit more? You want me to describe it, or you don't? So you do. OK. So um, we have, let's go back then. We have four key scales that make up the full scale IQ. It's a standard, um, standardized test, so um, the principles of that are, as you will you know, be, no be known. There's a verbal comprehension index, mm -hmm. and on that we have, uh, so your top left circle, we have tests um, of similarities. You present two words, what, uh, a drum and a piano, for example, and the child has to say what's the same about those. They're both musical instruments. There's a vocabulary test. They have to describe what a word is, what is winter, and a comprehension test. Um, what would you do in a certain situation? Um, there are also supplementary tests, but I'm not, we haven't used those for various reasons, so um, I, won't, I won't go into those. Um, the second index is the perceptual reasoning index, and this includes block design, which I'm sure you're familiar with, little blocks with red and yellow sides and a mixture, and you have to, you're shown a picture, a diagram, and you have to move the blocks to make the top surface of your blocks look like the picture that you've been shown, or that's there in front of you. Picture concepts, you're shown, shown a number of pictures and you have to sort of work, pick out one that matches with some others. And matrix reasoning. This is like Raven's uh, nonverbal matrices task. You're shown a matrix or a design, a little piece is missing, so it's like a little bit of the puzzle's missing, and underneath you have a few options, and you have to select the correct one to make the, the pattern complete. The working memory index, so <coughs> bottom left, uh, digit span, repeating numbers um, that you've been, been told, either forwards or backwards and letter number sequencing, where you're, you're told a series of letters and numbers mixed up together, and what you have to do is produce the letters in alphabetical order and the numbers in numerical order. So you've then got to extract letters and numbers and put them in order. And then finally, the processing speed index, which <laughs> includes coding um, and symbol search. In coding, you have to draw various symbols that are on the top of the paper matched with something else. So a number has a symbol associated with it on the top of the page, and if you see the number one, you have to look and draw the symbol that's associated with it. And then symbol search, looking for different items in a big page of symbols. So in this child study, I'm not sure whether the table looks very big on the screen, so apologies for that, but it's not hugely important. You can sort of trust me. I had 55 participants, 27 with DCD, and uh, 28 typical controls, um, 19 males in the DCD group, 15 in the control group, and their age range was between about 6 and 14. They're matched for age, they're matched for full-scale IQ scores, and they show big differences in their movement ABC. The children with DCD had received DSM diagnoses, and the typically developing children had no motor difficulty and no other diagnoses um, of developmental disorder. So first of all, the group comparison. We're just interested here in, are there any differences in the profiles of the DCD group 
versus the typically developing group. So here what you see is the mean standardised score, so that's got a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, for each of those four composite scores of the WISC um, that I've, I've just broadly outlined. So the first, first one, verbal comprehension index, uh, perceptual reasoning, working memory and processing speed. And the DCD children are the light blue bars, the typical children are the darker blue bars, and then the uh, error bars show standard error of the mean. So, the, and, oh yes, just to say the green line is just sort of marks out for you 100, the sort of standardised uh, mean. If we do a standard group comparison, we find only a significant difference between the DCD and the typical children on the processing speed index, which is the one on your far right, that pair of bars on your far right. And it's a small but significant difference. Now, you can see how it breaks down a little bit here, where what we have now <laughs> is each individual subtest score along the X horizontal axis. axis. And in fact, what you see now is that under verbal comprehension, the vocabulary, so I have to point here, the vocabulary um, subtest, actually this group of DC D, D children were significantly better than their typical peers. On the working memory letter number sequencing subtest, there's a, there's, a, there's a difference with the DCD children being a little poorer. <laughs> and on the two processing speed subtests, both of them coding and symbol search, there's a difference. So predominantly, where there are differences, they're not particularly huge. Um, and there that the DCD group is poorer than the typical group. But there's also this vocabulary subtest where, in this group at least, our DCD children are better than their peers. So, okay. But you can see from the error bars and, and by looking at the data um, and sort of understand, looking, knowing the data as we were considering it, it was very, very clear that there was quite a large range of scores between and within the individuals with DCD. And by that, what I'm meaning is I'm focusing now on the DCD group only. And there are children with DCD who have very <coughs> high scores on some tests and low scores on other. So they have a range of scores within their own single profile. And then there's also, if you compare across the DCD children, a big range of scores where you might have a DCD child who scores very highly on a subtest, another one who scores very low, and plenty in the middle. So it seemed from this to us that there'd be quite a mixture of scores within the DCD group. So, oh, <laughs> sorry, wrong one. So then we moved on to look um, a little at the individual profiles of the children with DCD. Okay, so the lines on here, I hope you can see they were they were dark when they created them, and they're now light on the screen. In fact, they may be a little brighter on here than on this screen. The gist of this is really to say that each of these figures is one child with DCD, chosen fairly randomly for this talk. And what you've got on the, the y-axis is the scaled score for this child on each subtest of the WISC. And along the bottom, you've got all the subtests and they're, they're listed in the order at the bottom of the slide. I don't think for the purposes of this talk it's hugely important what they all are, but we can, you can quiz me about that if you want to. Um, the point of this slide, if you can see it, is to say these are just six fairly randomly chosen children. I could have chosen, well, another 27 or another 22. Um, <coughs> they all look quite different. So, um, okay. some of them have fairly stable scores where their scaled scores are around 10, which is what you'd expect for their age on pretty much everything. Some of them go all over the place. 
Some of them are generally below 10, some of them are generally above 10. There seems to be no particular pattern um, of profile across the WISC tests on this group of children diagnosed very strictly using DSM criteria. Unfortunately, the sample size isn't large enough to do a proper cluster analysis. Um, so we can't, we can't do that. But certainly the data suggest that there isn't support in a child sample, at least in this one, for having one, two, or even three very specific DCD IQ profiles. We were quite pleased about that. Um, just to finish off, we did we took data that we'd collected from an adult study, also adults diagnosed with DCD using strict DSM criteria compared to a typically developing group. So this study essentially mimics the child study I've already shown you. And in this sample, we have 14 um, adults in each of the groups. Their age range is between 18 and 36. They're matched on age, IQ, full-scale IQ, gender, and the adults, um, although we can't, you know, they're too old to, to sort of use the movement ABC to some degree, we assess them with the movement ABC and a few other tasks, and they are hugely impaired relative to their peers. So I'm going to present the group comparison that I did before, and also the individual differences comparison, and see we can see whether there are similarities to the findings with children. So here, actually, I should say that in the Vexler Adult Intelligence Scale, um, the, we have the same kinds of subtests, but they're not described under those visual comprehension index, working memory index, perceptual processing, perceptual reasoning and processing speed indices. They're divided into a verbal IQ and a performance IQ scale. Um, so on this scale, what you've got is the scaled score for each subtest and group, um, where the scaled score mean for your age would be 10. That's the black line that's drawn across. And we have DCD participants in the light blue and typicals in the dark blue. And one of the really striking things about this figure to us was that there are hugely elevated scores in both groups above that scaled mean of 10. And I should say that this is probably not a particular characteristic of DCD adults. Um, I think our DCD child sample is much more representative of the general population. I think this sample is very much focused with a bias towards people who are studying in higher education. So that's, I think, why we have this sort of superior IQ <laughs> um, scores. Um, but nonetheless, um, if you look at a group comparison on each of these components, we see really quite significant differences in block design and matrix reasoning with the DCD group performing worse than their peers, but still well within what you'd expect for their age in this sample. Um, individual profiles, um, what I've done here is because we have less participants, I've tried to put the individual <laughs> profiles onto the one graph. And again, it, I think what this shows is that there's quite a messy profile. Um, mostly, we see in the performance IQ on your right, um, mostly we see a sort of dip for block design, which reflects that group difference on block design. But that's not true for all participants. There are a few who show actually a relative <coughs> personal peak on block design and some who just kind of seem similar. So what we're planning to do with both these child and adult data sets is just keep on boosting our numbers so that we can try and look more statistically at these profiles. But what we, what we think at the moment is that in both children and adults, there are more similarities and differences um, between DCD and controls in terms of the profile. Processing speed seems to come out as, as an area of perhaps uh, difficulty in the children. Performance IQ, a little more in the adults, reflecting that sort of block design matrix reasoning part, which isn't really coming out with the children so much. But 
what seems to us to be quite clear is that the individual profiles are very varied both between and within individuals with DCD. So at the moment, we would conclude that there isn't one or even two or three cognitive diagnostic profiles of DCD, which is very pleasing for us in the UK because we've been advocating very strongly that you can't diagnose DCD in the absence of a motor assessment or a detailed motor history. Um, and these data, we think, support that and also clearly point to more detailed investigation on this question. So to finish up and to leave any time for questions, over, over the two studies, um, we've hopefully persuaded you that, if you, if you needed to be persuaded, that the motor and the cognitive systems are interrelated. And this supports neuroimaging work from other areas, not from the area of DCD, that's been published in the last year or so um, to, that also supports this view. But although they co-vary or are interrelated to some extent, they are also clearly distinct from one another. And I think this sort of is kind of logical, given that one might argue that the motor system has sort of been evolving for 65 million years, but the cognitive system has probably been around in its sort of current broad format for the last five million years. So you know, evolutionary-wise, there's quite a big difference between these two systems. Um, we certainly need consideration of motor skill in children and adults with learning disability, more appropriate tests so we can start to probe a little bit better the, the expectations we might have for IQ and motor outcome in relation to the DSM ICD criteria for DCD. IQ profiles aren't, we don't think from these data, diagnostic, so they should be used sort of in conjunction with, but not in isolation from motor assessments. And I suppose it was logical that I'd say this, but I think there's a lot of further investigation that is needed, um, and perhaps combining of data sets um, to sort of build up numbers to do more detailed analyses. Okay, that's, that's the end of the first one. Thank you.